tonight on The Reno Show. I'm going to be helping you decide whether you should be selling or holding your property after renovating. Organisation Queen Marissa is showing you the best ways to stay organised during your bathroom reno and Mark's back to help you figure out the reasons why your home maybe isn't selling. Our garden guru Aaron is here to get your lawn ready for the winter months. Our chef Jody is cooking up a storm while you renovate and Rowan is here to clear up the differences between our zinc and our gal nails and screws. Hey guys, Naomi Finlay here. Okay. So you have worked so hard to get to this point. You have literally picked the perfect property and you are exactly where you wanna be. You know exactly what your upgrades are gonna be. You know exactly what tinkerings you're gonna be doing to that house. You even know who your ideal buyer is, what the suburb is and exactly what they're after amazing and best of all you've done all of this without letting anyone else tell you what you want great so have you decided what you're actually going to do once the renovation's done that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Today is all about how you're going to manifest your hard-earned profit. So Luckily, today's list is also pretty short. There aren't a million options for you to get lost in. There are actually only two primary choices here. But just because there's only two, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider each of them carefully. Why? Because remember all this talk before about finding your patch and about your personal strategy, and it's all about what works best for you. Well, it's the same principle here again. It's all about what will work best for you, your situation and your end goals. So let's jump on in. Now, number one, sell, sell, sell. The first option is to sell. It's pretty obvious. You buy a place, you renovate it, and then you sell it as soon as humanly possible. Simple, right? Well, this is what you're probably thinking when you hear the words house flipping. If you don't flip a pancake in time, it'll burn. Same thing when you're renovating a house. If you leave it in your possession for too long without doing anything to it, those sneaky interest repayments will burn holes in your potential profits. So you sell or you flip. Boom, profit is realized. Next project, here we come. Selling is great because it does let you see your profits almost immediately. There's no slow release, there's no drip feed involved. And that's pretty handy if you wanna jump, jump straight into your next reno. It's also nice to receive that sum in bulk. It's a great way of boosting your motivation after all of that hard work. So apart from the obvious quick release of profits, there are other benefits to selling straight away after a renovation. For one, all of your upgrades, all of your polishes will be absolutely fresh. That new oven will be shiny. Those covers and all that sleek, soft close hinges will be working perfectly. And the walls will have a perfect, beautiful finish, not a mark in sight. And then that way, your potential buyers will walk into the place and be like, wow, this is brand new. It is just for us and it's exactly the reaction you want. The other great thing about selling straight away is that you probably are selling more than likely in the same market that you bought in. Now this is especially handy if your market is hot, hot, hot. If you have a whole group of potential buyers that are diving over your property, then it is a winner. And for that, that means you'll actually make more profits in the end. But you should also consider the business aspect of this. The more assets you have in a business generally, the more risk that's involved. So getting rid of some of those assets will help reduce the risk and in turn reduce any stress and time of having to look after it all. 
Selling your renovation project will do exactly that, particularly if you're doing renovations on the side. It will help to not be burnt out by that side of business. So there are plenty of pros, right? Absolutely. But what about the downsides of immediately flipping the house or selling the house? Well, the first one of this is the money involved. Putting the house up for sale, paying agents fees, then paying your solicitor or your conveyancer, and all of the paperwork costs money, as does giving the government your share in whatever form of personal tax you may have to contribute. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that the market you're in at the moment isn't maybe a hot potato. Maybe all the buyers aren't fighting over it. Maybe you are better off waiting and seeing if your market moves. Interesting. All right, straight on to the second option now. Number two, the main second option that you have if you're not looking to sell is actually to lease or rent the property. So if you choose to keep the property, then obviously you would still want to be making money from it, especially now that you've put all of the hard work in to make it so awesome. So the simple solution to that is to lease it or rent it out. And this could be short stays, B&Bs or a long-term lease. Now, one of the perks of this option is that you get a consistent stream of money coming in. That's a great way of making sure that your own bills are paid for and you also don't have to pay any agent fees in selling the property. But the biggest perk, absolutely, is that you get to use the equity that you've just created in this amazing renovation to leverage and buy your next project. So although you don't physically see a big lump sum of cash, it's there for you to use on other properties. And this is a great way of avoiding some of those interesting taxes that you might be subjected to if you were to sell. Pretty great, huh? So what's not great about the renting option then? Well, I think the most annoying one would be that nothing stays new forever. Eventually, depending on how long you hold the property, of course, you'll probably, you know, have to give it some more touch-ups. That's just the nature of owning property and having it leased. Those flawless floorboards will eventually get a little bit scratched or faded, and those walls will show signs of day-to-day -day living, marks, dints, here and there. And that shiny state-of-the-art oven won't be shiny for long. In terms of capital though, nobody can see into the future. So it can be hard to see how long it will take for a property to grow in value if you choose to hold it even further and when it will be worth selling. So what about rental demand? What if that drops and you have a lower rent? Are you going to have enough serviceability to cover the loan? The other thing to think about, although they aren't a big chunk like an agent selling fee, is unless you manage the property yourself, you're going to have property management fees. And it's a small part of your rental income that will disappear. I'm absolutely not recommending that you self-manage the property unless that's something that you're skilled at. But it is something to consider and weigh up when you're considering these two options. So having all the information now, which option would you choose? Are you going to go for the buy, renovate, sell, the house flip? Or would you prefer to rent the project out uh, for the time being and see what happens? You know what? It all depends on you, your lifestyle, and your version of wealth. So be armed, be informed, and make the decision going forward. Bathroom renovations are actually one of my favorite parts of the renovation because there's nothing better than creating like this amazing space that you get to nurture your soul and take care of your body in after the renovation. But there's like a little tunnel that you need to go through before you get to that. And realistically, we use our bathrooms so often and every single member of the house uses our, your bathroom, their bathroom. And so if you're going to undertake a renovation of a bathroom and it's the only one in your house, it can present some substantial challenges. 
really. So we have here today Marissa Roberts from beautifullyorganised.com to talk to us about some of the really simple options that you can think about and plan to make that bathroom renovation a little less stressful from an organisation and a functional perspective. So Marissa, how do I go about not just stinking it up and smelling it up and washing the kids in the hose out the front? Like realistically, I can do that in summer. I can take them to the pool, throw them in and give them a shower afterwards, but I can't do that all year round. No, bathrooms are a really tricky one. You're dealing with no toilet, maybe no running water, certainly not the space you're used to and the area that you're used to, to keep everybody clean and smelling nice. And, and happy. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, a bathroom is a really tricky thing. It is. <laughs> You're going to be without running water in a lot of cases. You're certainly going to be without a toilet, sink, shower. Yeah. You may have to rough it a little and set up some camping style alternatives outside as far as toilets and showers Man, go. Man, it want to be warm. But otherwise, I would recommend if you can relocate for cleaning yourself, then I would do it. So friends or family or neighbours, see if you so can neighbors, use that space. Absolutely. Heading back to mum or dad's or brother or sister's house for a shower. If you've got a gym membership now's the time to use it now's the time to get fit <laughs> and get clean i love it Excellent. okay or what about house sitting house sitting is a great option okay. gives you everything you need you're helping another person and you're not spending a fortune if you do have a little bit of extra money i would recommend a staycation stay in your same local area but go and stay at a nice hotel at least for a week or so you know what there's a massive bonus of that is you can actually still be around to complete the renovation yep. if you're doing it yourself or if someone was doing it for you you can make sure that they're on track and everything is going exactly as you want so i'm certainly not a massive advocate for completely taking a vacation because i want to obviously be involved and in, involved in the renovation process yep. so in regard to setting up the bathroom outside are you like literally talking about hiring in a port loo or using a camping toilet? You can get DIY port loos with like a, a literally a toilet tent. Absolutely. You can do a port loo just get a small one for your family or if you're going to have a high traffic, a high amount of people going through, I'd recommend a port loo for that one. Okay. And then you don't have to empty it yourself. <laughs> it's always a winner. You want to keep it as clean as possible. Absolutely. All right. Now, what about all of the things? Like if you open up anyone's vanity cupboard or anyone's medicine cabinet, we have lots of stuff in there, like out of date medicines, makeup that I bought when like five years ago that I thought I'd really suit purple eyeshadow like you know there's so much stuff in our vanities and our medicine cabinets mm -hmm. so do you find that there's a way that we can survive on a minimal kit for an extended period of time when we're not actually camping like we still need to function and, and look like we're going to work I think in terms of really simplifying your signature look for this time standard makeup look hair look so that anything that you're not going to be using daily in terms yes. of hair tools accessories beauty routine makeup tools take them Packed out up. declutter them and pack away what you're going to keep and just keep a signature style for the time that you're renovating okay and that would go for every member in the house right absolutely okay yep. so it would literally be right this is the only shampoo your kids need it's a three-in-one for renovation yes. time <laughs> and you know what husband you can grow a beard this this week yep now's the time if you're going to try something new that's a little lower maintenance now's the time to do it all right i like it so keep it simple think outside the box i really like the idea of setting up a camp style bathroom and a camp style toilet that can be a phenomenal way whether you have the camping gear or not you'd be surprised at the amount of people that do have that sort of camping gear that you could even just borrow it off them for the week absolutely that is so keeping your cost down it's a fantastic idea and it could be quite an adventure you never know if you weren't a camper before you and your family might be a camper afterwards so thanks so much marissa they're great tips can't wait till you can come back on next time. Thank you. All right, everyone. Tonight we have a very prickly question Ooh. that I have. I know, it's scary. That I have MK Mark Kentwell from PRD Nationwide Newcastle and Lake Macquarie here to answer for me. Are you ready? 100%. Okay, brace yourself. All right, he's ready. So, 
I've got a house on the market, let's pretend, mm -hmm. and it's just not selling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do I do? What are my options? So many people get put in this position where for one reason or another, the house isn't selling yep. and they literally feel trapped. What can they do? Well, it's a really fair question. And you know, I coach a lot of agents around the country on educating clients. We've sort of moved from the sales business where we're controlling the whole process and yes. we've almost moved into the education business. Yes. And there's some advisory on there as well. So you've got to be monitoring what's going on around you, but then you've got to also look at things you can control. Okay. So let's look at the factors that govern you getting a great price. Okay. First one presentation. is presentation. You knew I was going to say that. All right. So like obviously we're assuming that the property is where it is, the location's set. Yep, and, can't control that. And the building is the building. We're not going to go through a full-scale reno to put it on the market. Correct. So we're just talking about controllables, presentation. Okay. All right. Okay. Presentation's a big one. Promotion, the size of the audience that you're actually marketing it to. So how wide the reach was of the campaign? Yeah, now okay. how far did you go in digital? Did you acknowledge that social media is a real way of selling property now? Yep. Did you still use a bit of print you to mean get that passive audience? You mean it's not just the newspaper? Sorry, <laughs> I was just playing with you. Sorry, keep yeah, going. It's definitely changed in that regard. You know, what strategy, you know, are you communicating well to the target markets, yep. quality of your photography, all that stuff. Okay. So presentation, home staging, gardens, everything that you coach people on. Yep. See, Naomi's one million episodes of how you can do that stuff, right? <laughs> and her world beating 102. career in staging. So second thing is promotion size of your audience. Third one, sale method. Oh. So is the sale method appropriate for the area, the agent's skill set, and is it creating That's, any demand? Can you expand on that? Because that is something that isn't often talked about. And I have yep. noticed it in my experience, and it heavily impacts, yep, absolutely. impacts the result. So it doesn't mean you have to do what all your neighbours are doing for the sale method to be appropriate for your circumstances. Okay. So, for example, I, I coach agents on how to be better at auction. And now, auction is an extra skill set you need to learn. It's sort of like you go and get your degree and then you get your master's. Yes. So, to, to get auction, you've got to know things that private treaty agents, you know, won't have, in their, they won't have in their tool bag. So, if everyone in the suburbs doing private treaty and you do an auction, that can be an advantage if the agent is competent at it. Okay. If you are creating demand and have a deadline date, you have a reason for buyers to come to you rather than sit back and watch whether the price come down. Yes. So that's an example. Now, there will be other examples where private treaty is absolutely appropriate. Like okay. if I've got eight units in one block that we're selling at once, trying to auction eight units at the same time, you're splitting... <laughs> then where's your supply yeah, and demand? Yeah, you're splitting all the buyers amongst eight things. <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe an auction for the first one to set the price higher and the others aren't available. Yep. Maybe then a private treaty process because you can compare how much better that unit is to the next one. Yep. You've got to be appropriate for the situation. So it's not a one size fits all. Definitely not. Okay. So presentation and promotion. promotion. Sale method. Sale method. Okay. Now we're into a couple of things. This is like an exam. Yes, it is. <laughs> now we're into a, a really big one and it's a touchy subject and it is price. Okay. So the big variable in this situation is if you've got your promotion right, Yep. If you've got your sale method right, yep. if your presentation's A1 and the market's not responding, like buyers are coming through it and they're not responding, there could be two things going on. One of them is that they're not agreeing with the price. The other mm -hmm. one might be the agent's not competent or capable of getting them to move ahead and make an offer or following them up or whatever it might be. All right. So what happens in that circumstance then though? What do I do? What are my options? Okay. So you need to do a little x-ray slash survey of what's going on around you. Okay. Because if it's fundamentally changed from when you started the campaign, yep. that's not necessarily the agent. That's the market changing right in front of you. Yep. Like if you opened a Mr. Whippy franchise selling ice creams and then a Wendy's opens up down the corner. Yep. That's a change in direction, change in business plan. You know, yep. you've got new competition in the market. Fair call. So if other properties are coming on, they're better priced or they've sold or they've taken money or buys or whatever, you need to say, okay, can we now adjust our price and still get on with this and get what we need out of it? Okay. What are we doing with the money? So you're going to reframe. Else? Yeah, and you've got to sit down, you've got to weigh those options up. Yeah. If you think it's an agent issue, that's a, it's a whole other kettle of fish. Now, hopefully okay. you've chosen your team well and you spent a lot of time on agent analysis. You haven't just yep. picked the cheapest one. So you important. haven't just picked the one that's told you the highest price. So important. You haven't just picked the one that's told you what you want to hear. No, you don't need to do that little bit up. You don't need to worry about home no, staging. No, the purple wall is okay. Yes. Never list an agent that says the purple wall is okay. Yeah, it's just a dangerous colour in real estate. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've I never heard it described <laughs> like that. 
Uh, <laughs> those that are in the real estate industry will know why I'm saying that. Right. I'm not going too much further with it. Okay. So, so what do I do? Do I keep it on there and just flog the dead horse? Do I rest it? What do I do? Okay. So if you've got faith in your agent, I'll cover that one first. Okay. You've got faith in your agent. They're selling properties everywhere else. Things are going well. They've got a good reputation. You've been referred in. Yep. And you don't think it's the agent. Yep. Then it's a price problem and you're thinking, I don't want to lower my price. I'm just not going to get what's worth selling this out of. I'd rather yep. you know, stay put or look at other options. Yep. You can rest the property. Okay. Okay. Now, what can happen in the rest period? If you're still living in the property, well, you just go on there living your life. All good. Happy days. And then you're waiting for the supply and demand equation to get back in your favour. Okay. Now, you've got to have a look at the, the macro climate and your market as well. Is it likely to be a one-year thing or a five-year thing or a three-month thing? Yep. It's pretty rare it's three months, I've got to say. The difference in three months is not dramatic in the market. Okay. It's more likely to be a one year to five year plan okay. if you're looking for a really serious swing. Okay. You'd be almost better having a 5% price adjustment and get, getting the action. It and it might not be at the price you adjust too. If you're using price guiding, if you're using auction, yep. you might find this competition, you end up close to where you want to be anyway. Okay. And you move on and you're buying in the same market and you, and you, and you take those gains with you. If you're going to move out of it and put a tenant in the property, you've yep. got to think about, okay, I've got to restage again next time. Is, the additional are, cost. Are Is they it going worth to bash just it a up? small price drop? Yeah, they're going to bash it up, like paint-wise and all that. Even great tenants still mark up property. Well, it's wear and tear. It's Natural wear and tear. Normal wear and tear. So then you've got to come back in and consider those costs as well. Okay. And then if there is a serious gain, um, you've got to look at, did it become a capital gains issue because it's no longer your principal place of residence? And you'll get good advice on that. And there are some provisions about how long you can leave it. Absolutely. But you know, if it's going for several years, it might be something you really need to take into account. So this is where a good agent and potentially someone who's in your financial advice sphere can sit down with you. But a good agent can look at these options and say, look, this is where they're probably going to buy it. Yep. But when you adjust the price, you don't just adjust the price, you remarket the property as well. Interesting. Because you're now in a new category. Those buyers might not have been seeing it before because it was locked out on their filter on realestate.com yeah, yeah. or domain. Uh -huh. Now you adjust to the new price guide and you You can actually get a harder. whole new influx. Absolutely, especially if you pump it harder. So and if you're going from, say, 650 down to 590, mm. different kettle of fish. Under 600. Yeah. So that's a new bracket of people who might have been looking up to six. So you market harder in that bracket. It's almost like a fresh listing again. Okay. Everything and you sells can do that without fresh. resting. You could do that just with a price adjustment. Absolutely. Like, you know, there might be buyers circling that property. They're just going, geez, I really hope it doesn't sell because I can't Driving afford it. Driving past that. going, I hope they're still there when I can afford it. It happens. And, you know, with your agent, you're sitting down, you're agreeing on the game plan, how much communication you want, what kind of feedback you want about the buyers that are coming through, yep. whether you, you want open homes and private appointments, the days, the times that you've got access, you're all agreeing to hold your nerve and put some stamina into it. Yep. And, and once you've tried that, absolutely, if you're still not hitting it at the revised price, you're kind of in a position then where you might be saying, look, I'm forced to rest. Yes. Because I, I just can't afford to sell it for less than this. Yes. You reassess your whole game plan. You know what's the biggest thing that I've gotten out of this is the importance, and I always talk about how an agent is an epic part of your team. Mm. Even if you're not renovating to flip and sell, it's so important that there's agent information, local on the ground knowledge into your renovation that you're doing. And it's about communications and relationships. So I think that's awesome. Because one of the things that you just said then, and it was awesome, is, um, about having open conversation, making a commitment together to mm -hmm. how you're going to sell that property. Absolutely. And, and, and again, I, I implore you to, to not only choose your agent based on the fee that they're offering, because there's a lot going on behind the scenes in the agents that are a full service outfit. Yep. And there's very little going on behind the scenes on the low service outfits. Everyone's working on similar actual profit margins. It's just some people have got a lot less people in the process or a lot yes. less thought or a lot less competence. And if you ever ask for an agent that charges their selling fee without success, I'd be really looking at that. And there are looking out there. Looking at that hard. Looking at it hard. Marketing's different. That's not the agent. That's the campaign that they're booking for you yep. and project managing they're and all that. They're hard costs. They're hard costs, just like painting your house. That's but right. an agent that says, here's my fixed selling fee and we'll do everything for you, uh, as if they've got the same level of interest in getting you a great Where's result. Where's the buy-in? Where's the skin? Mm, Not totally a lot of different. skin in that game. Watch out for those ones. Okay. All right. Thanks, MK. Great to have you back on the show. My pleasure. Hey, Renovator.
renovators, there's one thing I love more than a bathroom renovation, and that's a lawn renovation. And we have Aaron with us from Green Envy again to talk about what we need to do with our lawns. So we've seen the worst of summer, we're heading into autumn, and you know, like my lawn generally looks really thatchy and pretty gross over winter. Aaron, how can I, how can I have this gorgeous lawn all winter? We're at the end of summer now, Naomi, and the preparation starts now. Um, oh God, is that prep, prep, prep again? It pretty much is prep, prep, prep again. <laughs> so if we leave it now and we start to get dry out too much, we don't make the most of the warm weather that we're still going to have in okay. autumn and the growth we've got in autumn, we won't get it to revive in winter. Okay. So our worst times for the lawn are going to be summer and winter. Um, okay. If we can get to the end of summer and make it to autumn and spring, that's our time to start to bring it back and rejuvenate it, make it look good for the other times of year. Perfect. Um, not much we can do in summer because we've just got hot weather and what we've had lately is just dry, dry, dry and dry. Absolutely. So we need that bit of rain and we need the fertiliser and that sort of thing in it to boost it back. So do that now. So water now, fertilise now, get us in good stock, nice and healthy yeah. to last through winter. Spot on. But the healthier we can get it now, the stronger it's going to be through those seasons. Perfect. So what are the top three things we need to be doing to this lawn now? Okay, so what we're looking at at the moment, we've got, we've had dry weather, we've just had a little bit of rain, it's just started to boost back a little bit. Okay. So we need to get some food into it so that we can get it to get some energy to grow. Perfect. Now, one of the things that it's probably, you know, getting that food onto the ground and trying to get it into the ground is a difficult thing when the, the ground's so dry and crusty. Yeah. So I'd probably recommend, number one, get a wedding agent on. Okay. And that wedding agent helps to draw the moisture through, but it also draws the fertiliser down to the so root system. So it stops it being hydrophobic, right? You're spot on. That's hey, a big word and we've got winning. it. <laughs> so the more we can get that water in, the better it's going to perform. Perfect. So number one tip, get a wedding agent on. Yes. Number two tip, get some fertiliser on. Now, Perfect. We can Any use... fertiliser? No, I'd probably suggest there's a, there's a good range of fertilisers out there and you, know, you can grab basically anything off the shelf anywhere you go now. Perfect. Uh, what you've got to be careful of though, if we go with something that's too high in nit nitrogen or too high in salts, we can burn the lawn more. Okay. So what we're trying to get is something that will feed the root system of the lawn and get a bit of lateral growth out of it without trying to put too much green in there just yet. Perfect. And I think like your, your number 17s and your high nitrogen ones, okay. save them for Christmas and save them for when you've got when the family coming around. When you want that around. beautiful green lawn Spot to on. roll on. Spot on. Okay. So, and it's a good idea too to alternate the fertilisers. Use an organic one one time and use an inorganic one another time. Okay. You get a fast response out of the inorganic ones. Yes. But they can build up in the soils and they can create toxicity. Okay. So an organic one every now and then helps to balance that back out, helps to bring it back in. So number one one thing is the wetting agent, number two is the fertiliser. What is the third thing? Well the third thing, um, we are, we're looking at a lawn here that's not too bad. We've probably got a little bit of thatch build up in it. With that yep. little bit of thatch build up, you could run a scarifier over and take the top off the yes. lawn. Um, obviously you wouldn't do that um, after feeding it, so you'd probably okay. save your feeding till afterwards. But you know, you can remove the thatch down if you've got a thick and spongy lawn. If your lawn's not too thick and spongy, you'd even consider whether you do a bit of top dressing as well. Okay. Water is the key though. So you've water. got to punch the water in. And you must do that not just every now and then. It's consistent keep that up. and so not every three weeks. Not every three weeks. So Naomi, I'm sorry, but yeah, you know, a little bit more water for your lawn is going to keep it going. <laughs> a little better. bit more love for this lawn is what it needs. So there's the top three things. So wedding agent, fertilizer, and if you have a nice thick spongy one, what were you calling it? Dethatch it. De so take the top it. off it, get rid of that sponginess. And if not, maybe a bit of topsoil. Perfect. Oh. Have you ever tried to cook for your family while your home was undergoing a major renovation? It can be a huge challenge. Our resident chef and creator of Hello Table, Jodie Blight, is here to help with her simple and delicious recipes that are ideal for the family whilst renovating.
You know what? In our world nowadays, there are so many options in everything, right? That's right. Options in food, options in drink, options in cars. And I tell you, there are some options available when you hit in your store for screws. Or we do have, yeah. we do have some nails here. Nails, yep. There are so many different options. And I mean, even to a seasoned renovator, I go in there and every six months there's a new finish, there's a new head, there's a new something. Yes. And it can be really overwhelming. Don't get overwhelmed by it because essentially they're all doing the same thing. Fixing they're fixing shit. one thing to another thing, okay? <laughs> the difference is what is the thing that they're fixing to the other thing? How and big does it need to be? How big is it? What sort of weight is it carrying? If it's carrying any weight, and whereabouts is it? Is it outside? Is it inside? That's essentially what it comes down to. So don't get too thrown. A lot of this stuff does the same stuff as other things do. They've just got different names and different coatings and things like that. So, so when I read this though, there's just so much information. And one of the things that stresses me a little is that it across different brands, it doesn't feel that standardized. Some things do, like obviously the length of the screw or the length of the nail, the gauge, so the how gauge, fat, yeah, yeah. how fat or skinny yep. or broad or slim yep. um, the shank of the nail is. But then they have other really interesting things, like you have a bugle head, you have, I saw earlier we have, I don't even know the name for There's it. There's a the, square fix here. The square fix yep. here. Or type 17 it's called. So There you go, it's not yeah. even called square fix, that That's would be right. too simple. Yep. It's called a type 17. Mm -hmm. And then you have your standard Phillips, and then you have your normal nails. Normal nails. But then we go like one step further. So here, what have we got? We've got gold. We've got gold, gold passivated. Right. Galvanised. We've got stainless here. We've just got raw steel here. We've got brass. I don't even know what these have got coated on them. Um, <laughs> you know. Oh look, it's even got a cool name. It's called Florentine bronze. Oh, there you go, Florentine bronze. So it's it's got an artificial. And coating then what's on as well. that about? That looks so like treated army. Pine. So um, army green nails. Yeah, that's right. And these have got what's this called? Climber coat. Is Climber that the coat. coat. That's right. Climber coat. So That's a Climber you, coat three. Can you see why people just go, I'm out, I'm yeah, opting out? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I suppose it's like a lot of things. The suppliers will, will try and drill down to as niche as possible so that they can um, cap, capture that part of the market. Capture they, that market. They so need. But essentially what it comes down to is uh, what sort of exposure to the elements is your fixing going to have? What size do it, does it need to be? Um, and what's it fixing? All to, right, so, so let's go from like the most hardcore battering elements ever. So I'm on a, I'm on the beachfront. Yes. Literally, I'm on the beachfront and I have beach water lapping over some part of my front fence or front deck every day because I'm on absolute beachfront. How cool would that be? That would, well, yeah, for the, unless there's a king tide. Yeah, <laughs> good point. So what's my like ultimate ultimate material stainless, super, super hard stainless steel is the one to go with something like that so is that sta that's stainless that's stainless steel grade 304 which you can see there just down there that comes in grade 316 as well which is slightly better grading stainless steel but that's basically the two that you will get stainless steel is rated for marine applications so this okay. will withstand so for my beachfront house we're okay yeah so it kind of it tends to resist oxidization pretty well um salt which is incredibly corrosive, uh, especially when um, the salt and fresh water, when mixed together, become acidic. Yes. So that will um, eat away most coatings, but stainless steel is pretty resistant for that sort of stuff. Not saying that it will stay... Um, beautiful forever. Beautiful forever. You, like everything, you need to maintain it. You need to replace it when it starts to corrode, because it will over time. Uh, and the Australian sun will destroy just about anything okay so if we go down the ladder okay next step down from stainless would yep. probably be something like a galvanized hot dip okay. galvanized okay so hot this dip is galvanized hot what dip it took a dip in a hot 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 tub a hot a hot pool of gal of zinc basically okay. is what it comes right. down to good so hot dip galvanizing is um it's called hot dip because basically they put whatever the base metal is generally steel uh or iron into a boiling vat of zinc at about 450 degrees and Hot that tub. will yeah that will bond to the base metal and the difference between something like a hot dip galvanizing and this is called gold passivated 
uh, right. which is still a zinc coating, but the difference being this one's about 16 times thicker coating than this one. Hence, more resistant to yes, corrosion. Yes, and the zinc acts as um, what they call as a sacrificial anode, so it will corrode before the base metal corrodes. So that's And hence, lose your fixing. Yeah, that's right. So that's why okay. it's there. And then if, if you're not in a marine environment, then Galvan, you're outside, Galvanise the best way to go. All right, but then where does Climacote fit in? Let's go to that. Well, Climacote, okay, so this is a product that uh, has been developed by um, this company um, to be specifically for treated pine. So there's okay. some chemical elements in treated pine that- Obviously, will, to stop corrosion and termites. Will, yeah, and that's right. There's so, some lovely chemicals in treated pine. There's some lovely chemicals, <laughs> so have your mask on when you're cutting it, if you can Correct. do that. And then when you've cut it, treat the ends of it. Um, with more chemicals. With more chemicals. Um, but yeah, there are there are some elements in that treatment that may cause corrosion and pitting on. Some and so that's pretty much like putting your screw in a glove to protect yes, it yes. from the chemicals. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I like it. Like All right. What else have we like got a here? Color bond coating for your, okay. your um, screw. Okay. So we have solid brass now. Solid brass. Not a goer outside. No, internal only. Internal only. Mm -hmm. And why no would moisture. I use that over, so something like this is a wood screw that's just zinc plated? Well, it depends. That's uh, just a much, much nicer color to look at. So that's so it's just it's prettier. pretty much an aesthetic <laughs> choice there, really. So, um, and you can see these are wood screws uh, designed for, possibly designed for, for cabinetry because you're fixing, you've got quite a big open thread here, but you can see the shank here is bare of thread. So what you're actually doing there is you're pulling a piece of timber to something, another okay. piece of timber basically. So you're compressing it together. Whereas if your thread went all the way through like this, yep. you're actually screwing those two bits. So the top piece of timber has is fixed to the bottom piece with a consistent thread through okay, it. Okay, so it's not just bringing them together, no, it's actually right. fixing them that's together. That's right. So with this one, what you'll be doing is your top piece of timber will actually have a bigger hole in it. Yes. Than the bottom piece. Okay. Because the bottom piece will be, the top piece will be getting pulled down on top of it. Normally in conjunction with maybe some wood glue or something like that. So in some cabinetry or something yep. like that. Um, and it'll be, essentially it's clamping it together, whereas that's screwing it together. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, so yeah. people are kind of going, oh my gosh, I've got to think about length, I've got to think about gauge, I've got to think about where it is, I've got to think about what I'm using. And literally, if you walk down into a hardware store and there are, I, I would say, I would even guess there's nearly a hundred options. Oh, there'd be many, many, many more in a big warehouse. Many, yes. Many, many, many more. But um, essentially- So what do you do? What do you do? Ask, if you're ever in doubt, then ask. That's, okay. That's the best thing. So basically what it comes down to is is size and application. Where is it going to be? Is it outside? So when you inside? go into a place and you say, hey, I need a screw, you need to be able to give them answers. What am I what am I fixing? So what, what am I fixing and where it where is it? That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretty there you much. go. Yeah. They're the golden rules. What am I fixing? Where is it? And if you can't get the information from the, the snippet, so the 101 of fixings <laughs> that we've just given you, remembering that stainless steel is the king. There's really good descriptions on the back of most fixings too. They'll give you a fairly good idea of the fit for purpose used for that fixing. So if you're ever in doubt, then check that. And also with some of these um, like bugle head fittings, they'll tell you on the back the type of tool you need to fix it as well because it's not often just a screwdriver head or stand Phillips head, so you might need to buy that from the tool shop as well. Otherwise, you're going to get home and go, well... You're going to be sorely disappointed. You will be. <laughs> and no one hates it more than me or you, I'm sure, or mm -hmm. you at home, um, by having to go back to the hardware store. You've just spent six hours there grabbing your gear, and you, for the sake of something that's $2 that was in a little corner of the tool shop. Yeah, so check out, exactly, check out the tool you need check to the tool put these in. Yeah. Absolutely. Hope that's made a little bit easier. Next time you walk down the tool aisle, you'll feel a little bit further along the spectrum from novice to expert when it comes to all things fixings and screws. A camping toilet will do the trick. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I I've lost that one too. Really? It would be so cool to have a party here. Perfect. So. Hold on, let's stop into the car. If you're okay. going to, uh... sorry, I stopped that one. Okay. Too much hot and humid and let's wet weather. Let's do that weather. again. Um... Yeehaw! Next time on the Renault Show, 
I'll show you how to sell well with my best staging and styling tips. Jen from Interiors Addict is sharing this year's top outdoor trends. Property analyst John Linderman is giving us his insider secrets for buying the right property. Rowan is here to tell us why you should choose a hardwood deck over anything else. And I'm hanging out with Bristol Paints to show you how to use rinse-free sugar soap. Catch you then. Remember to like and subscribe to our channel to receive weekly renovation and lifestyle inspiration. If you have a question about today's show, leave a comment below and we'll be sure to get straight back to you. Hey guys, have you heard about the amazing new renovation app? It is the Rapid Renomate app for your phone, for iPhones and Androids, and it has just taken renovation to a new level of ease. It can track everything from your timelines to your budget, to your paint colors, your supplies, and your tradies. It has truly transformed, streamlined, and made the renovation process so much easier. If you'd love to get your free app right now, click the link below and download it immediately to your iOS or your Android device. Happy renovating.